those if we start singing, they'll sit down. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. was blind, I could not see, chains of sin had shackled me, but God in heaven heard my plea, Jesus, Jesus rescued me, Jesus, Jesus rescued me, I will sing forever of your love, come down, take my hands to Shout your praises loud I was lost in darkness When you pulled me out I will sing forever Of your love and love Now Welcome to Fox Valley Christian Church. We're glad that you're here with us on the coldest day so far this year, right? I'm surprised there's this many here, but welcome. If you would, please uh, turn to somebody next to you, tell them good morning, and tell them what your favorite thing to do is when it's below zero.
Welcome to Fox Valley Christian Church, where every member is a missionary. I just want to, before I jump into that, I got to say this. So I was sitting behind you guys, and I don't know if you guys have seen or not, but I'm behind Celia, and Celia has a shirt that says, my bestie is a black belt. And then Jaden hits me, and she's like, did you see Delaney's shirt? It says, I'm the bestie. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so you are a missionary. Uh, we are looking for 1,000 invites, 100 Bibles, in 10 new groups. Uh, just a reminder uh, about this. We're talking about a thousand invites to ministry opportunities. This could be a church service. It could be a small group. It could be a Bible study. It could be coffee where you are talking about Jesus. We are inviting people to opportunities for them to know our Lord and Savior. That doesn't mean they say yes. We're going to hear a lot of no's, but praise God for the yeses that we hear. 100 Bibles that we give out to people that don't have them, and then 10 new groups where we're really looking to start groups in places where it might be hard for people to even make it here, right? But we're giving them more ministry opportunities so that they can know uh, about God. So let's actually, one more thing to say about that. Sometimes people ask, you can either fill out the QR code to let me know. You can fill out the slip in back that's on the communion table back there to let me know. Or you can just tell me. Um, some people, like Brent, are tremendously lazy, and they're like, hey, I invited somebody. I'm like, okay, I'll write it down. Um, so you can just tell me, too, and I'll write it down, and I'll put them up there, right, just so that we know that. So I'm going to pray, and then, we'll, uh, and then we'll jump in. So, God, we love you. Uh, God, and we just, God, we thank you that we were able to be here uh, this morning and gather. Uh, God, to be in your presence, to be uh, with your people. Uh, God, we pray that we... Uh, can glorify you not just this morning, God, but with our lives as we go. Uh, God, and we pray for your word that we are going to be uh, digging into today, God, that it just helps to uh, strengthen us and to fortify us. Uh, and we just love you so much. Uh, and we just pray in your son's name. Amen. So we're walking through uh, the book of Luke 
Uh, and if you remember, what we're doing is, is we are kind of, we're kind of skipping through the book of Luke. This is our first go through. We're going to go through this multiple times. But we're skipping through the book of Luke because we're walking to the resurrection, right? Uh, on Easter Sunday, that's the point we'll be in Luke. Then we're going to come back and we're going to talk through some of the stuff uh, that we missed. Uh, but as we're walking through Luke, uh, what we are looking at is Luke wrote this book to Theophilus so that Theophilus could have certainty in what he heard. This is not Theophilus's first time hearing the gospel. Instead, he's saying, you've heard the gospel, you've heard about Christ. Now, I'm writing this book, and I'm putting enough information in here that you can have certainty of what you've heard, because it's not enough to just say, well, I've heard it, and yeah, I kind of, I kind of believe it. Yeah, maybe it's true. He says, you have to have certainty and I'm going to give you ample evidence so that you can have certainty in what you've heard. Now, I, 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 literally, I, I can't say it enough. I could say this every week. The gospel is true. That's why I believe that it's true. My belief in the gospel does not make it true. The gospel is the truth. Therefore, I believe, which means that we can have certainty in the truth of the gospel, and that's what we are uncovering. Now, this week, I read something, and when I read it, I debated, right? Do I just read it back? Do I summarize it? And I decided I'm just reading it back because, uh, because it's, it's, it's history, okay? This was written 40 years ago, almost 40 years, like, to the day. This is March 18th, so we're just a couple months off of it. So March 18th, 1984, 40 years ago, it says, last Thursday... Noel and I took about three hours of our day off visiting computer stores to find out what sort of word processing possibilities we might be able to afford. We went to the library and read the latest consumer reports, all right, like wild, uh, and then went to four stores downtown. It was an amazing experience. I came home with a stack of literature with my mind reeling. Here's what I learned. Computers are like sex. There's something in us that, that, that can hook and hold. Computers are like a romance or an epic or an adventure which has come true before our very eyes. They combine mystery and power and precision and beauty. They are exciting and new and with open-ended possibilities. Our culture is in for unimagined and irreversible effects from the microcomputer revolution. I don't doubt that virtually every one of us will have one at home by 1994. The uses will expand, the prices will fall, and they will be as common as the telephone. But for now, they're unusual and wonderful and so real in their strangeness. One of the effects that they can have on a Christian is to make us feel like spiritual things are very unreal and unexciting. You could see a computer, you can handle a computer, a computer can give you immediate feedback and solutions. They hold a very powerful fascination. But the Bible speaks largely of unseen things. Things that don't force themselves onto our senses, things that are sometimes far away and in the past. You all have had these experiences with some new gadget or toy or appliance. How easy it is to come home with a bundle of colorful brochures about word processing and lay them aside half-read in order to enjoy the voice of God in Scripture. I read that, and I was like, wow, 1984. He was so right and so off the mark, right? He was so right and so off the mark. If I brought home a handful of colorful brochures about a word processing system, ain't nobody in my house going to read them because they don't have to because we have shorts and we have YouTube and we have Facebook and we have social media. You can find out whatever you want in an instant. We have blogs that you can jump on and you can read. You want to know something? Google it. Oh, sorry, Josh, that was yesterday. If you want to know something, just jump on the latest AI and see where they can lead you to find that information. Everything is at our fingertips. And it's so awesome. It's so, no joke, fully planned on, on reading this. And yesterday, <laughs> I love my mom. My mom sends me a text and she says, uh, so Josh, this Apple Vision Pro, what what is this? And I see some of you going, Apple Vision Pro, I don't even know what that is. Neither did I, right? I'm like, mom, what do you do in your spare time? What's Apple Vision Pro? So I looked it up, literally VR, but you could see everything, right? So it's a clear screen in front of you. You could see everything. You can have multiple displays in your environment. You can make a TV as big as you want while talking to the person next to you on your couch. I was like, this is absurd. You can have multiple voice calls with people in front of you and see them in the size you want them and be looking at them around the room. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. 
That's so much crazier than what was in this computer. But what that means is we have so many things that are just stealing our attention and vying for our attention. And they're so marvelous and wonderful that we want to look into them and see about them and know about them. And that's just a little bit of our distractions. We have YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, social media. We have things to shock us, to amaze us, to make us laugh. We have things that we can't wait to show somebody. We have little things that there's just a glance of a picture and we say, oh my goodness, I've got to click that. I have to see more. What is this thing? And we waste time upon time upon time. The, the, the computer is not as common as the phone, right? Right? Really, there is no phone. There's the computer that we bring with us all the time that, oh yeah, we could talk to people on our computer that we have everywhere so there's not a single minute that we don't have to be bored. We can always be distracted, always have something consuming us. And how in the world do we set that aside and just pick up the Bible and read it especially if we don't know God. Very interesting thing, right? There's Bible study meeting at my house with uh, high schoolers uh, and, and, and just into college. And so my daughter's one of them leading it, and she told me, she's like, this book is incredible. And I was like, yes, it's the Bible. It was written by God. And I could say that, and I could say that, and I can say that. And so many people, they don't even believe it, and they don't even understand it because it seems old, it seems distant until you step into it and start reading the very words of God and you're like, this is so much better and richer than anything else I could have in my life. But what I want to point out today is that when we leave here and we have all of these different distractions vying for our attention, guys, guilty. Guilty. I get it, right? We have all of these distractions that are vying for our attention. They're not just distractions. They're not just simple little things. I'm not condemning them. I'm not against them. I, I, I use some of these things, right? But really what it is, is we have an enemy who is literally taking each one of them and just putting them in front of us and enticing us. You don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this. Oh man, this is funny. Oh, this is amazing. And just desensitizing us and letting us look at the word of God and say, I don't know, I've got something else to do right now. You know, I've been around a lot of people that have died. I've been around people that it's been their last months, it's been their last weeks, it's been their last day, it's been their last moments. Never, never have I had somebody when I was there say, hey, will you do me a favor? I can't do it on my own. I was watching this series on Netflix. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to finish it. Could you pop that up there so I can finish it? I've never had somebody say to me, hey, could you grab my phone really quick? Will you pull up my social media account? Will you just read my Facebook page to me? I, I need to know what's going on. Could you just read that out loud to me so I don't miss anything? I've had multiple people say, will you do me a favor? Will you just read the Bible? Will you just read the Bible to me? It's like all of a sudden in those moments, everything becomes clear. Because we're not worried about immediately missing out or this new thing. We recognize all of those things genuinely. At the end of the day, they're just nothing in comparison to God. My prayer this morning is that we leave here recognizing we have an enemy and having a plan for how we're going to be equipped in the face of that enemy. So we're going to jump in this morning, and we are going to look at the temptation of Christ. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about the baptism of Christ, specifically because Luke, is fo Luke focused on John, right? And on John the Baptist, like what he was teaching before he baptized Jesus, that's where our primary focus was. So I just want to read this really quick, because Jesus did get baptized. Luke 3 21 to 22 says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my, my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. There are two things that happen here that each one of the Gospels make clear to us. Now Luke is going to do something kind of weird. It's different, it's weird, 
right? But if you look at it, it makes so much sense. So the two things that we see in each one of the Gospels, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus. We see Jesus equipped, empowered, and full of the Holy Spirit in this moment, and we see that God proclaims that Jesus is his son. So there is this proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we're getting ready to go to the temptation, right? From the proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God to the temptation of the Son of God. And typically, that's what we're going to see. But not with Luke. Remember, Luke is writing this intentionally. He's got a purpose that he's trying to do here. What he does is he goes from baptism to genealogy to temptation. Kind of weird, right? Like Matthew Matthew's got it right. He starts with the genealogy. Why don't we start with the genealogy and step in? But Luke doesn't. He doesn't even put the genealogy at Jesus' birth. He goes from baptism to genealogy to temptation. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is tempted as the Son of God. And then he's got this genealogy. Now, his genealogy does not just go back to David. His genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Adam, who is called a son of God, right? Adam, a son of God, the first man. And what Luke's doing is, is Luke is showing us there is a connection between the son of God and between Adam. There's something important that we have to see here. There are some similarities. So Adam was the head of all humanity that came after him. Jesus is greater. Jesus is the head of the new creation. Jesus is the head of those redeemed by God, empowered by God. Jesus is the head of all. Adam was tempted and failed, and because of that, we have misery. Jesus is on the brink of being tempted in every way so that we can have victory. Luke is showing us that Jesus, the new Adam, proclaimed by God as the Son of God, is getting ready to go on our behalf, and where Adam failed in temptation with fruit on a tree, Jesus is going to be tempted in every way, and he's going to succeed. And he's trying to make that clear to us that something new is about to happen. Something important is about to happen. My question that I have, because it's so easy to do this, right? It's so easy. We pick up our Bible and we start reading and we read, oh, John said this and Jesus was baptized and here's the genealogy. And then there's Jesus and he goes into the wilderness and he's going to be tempted. And it's easy for us to read that and to kind of gloss over it. It's easy for us to read that and say, well, yeah, I know. I mean, when I grew up in the church, they talked about Jesus' baptism. They talked about Jesus' temptation. Do you recognize what's at stake here? Do you recognize how significant and important of a moment this is? If we recognized how significant and important of a moment this is, we would be on the edge of our seats. Especially if it was your very first time. If it was your very first time hearing this, you'd be on the edge of your seats because if you were told, like Theophilus, this is the gospel message. Jesus lived a perfect life and he died for you so that you could be saved. You'd get to this part here and you'd say, Jesus is going to the wilderness and for 40 days, Satan is going to tempt him. He has to win. Our eternity is in the balance. Our salvation is in the balance. Our redemption is literally in the balance in this moment. If Jesus fails in combat, we are doomed for all eternity. If Jesus succeeds and turns away from every temptation in this life, then we can be a new creation and co-heirs with Christ. That's a big deal. So how does Jesus prepare for battle? How does fully man? Fully God. How does he prepare for battle? Luke 4, 1 to 2. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. For 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Such an, such an obvious statement, right? And he was hungry because he's also fully man. The first thing we see is Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit first thing that we see is that Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. This is one of the most powerful aspects of Jesus's life on earth. The fact that we see Jesus baptized and the Holy Spirit descends on him and that he's full, that the Bible makes it clear, full of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit led him to be tempted. This is one of the most powerful aspects. I'll explain to you why. Because we know that our unlimited God, we've talked about this before, our unlimited God He is sovereign. He literally can do anything. All power, all knowing, unlimited. He willingly limits himself. He willingly limits himself. 
anytime he puts a rule that he agrees to follow, he's limiting himself. I mean, he did that in the very beginning, right? When he created, and then we sinned, and then he said, okay, there's only one way, and it's the way that I'm going to save you. He has limited himself. And he says, this is the only way that I will save you. When God became man and took on flesh, God limited himself. He had to. Because the end of this road was going to be Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus was going to die. Anybody know how you kill God? I have no idea how to kill God. You can't kill God unless God limits himself so that you can. Unless he limits himself so that he can be a sacrifice for all humanity. God limited himself, fully God, fully man. And in that, then we see that when he hits this age where he's getting ready to do ministry, God takes and he equips and empowers him with the Holy Spirit. From this point on, we are going to see Jesus do some absolutely incredible things filled with the Holy Spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, right? That's what we're going to see. That, that should be like, wow, because fast forward, then God equips us with the Holy Spirit. How does Jesus stand in the face of temptation? Because he is equipped and empowered with the same Spirit that lives in us. That's the very first most powerful thing that we see happening here. Our God is alive, and he's active, and he's present. I could stand up here every week, blah, 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 blah. talking, making encouragements, telling you what I see in Scripture and saying, hey, listen, because of this, you should do this. Because of this, I encourage you for this. Because of this, I plea you for this. If that, if th that's all you have is coming and listening to me on Sunday mornings, you are not ready. You're going to walk out those doors and temptation's going to come and all these distractions are going to be in your way and you're going to, you're going to fail and you're going to fail and you're going to say, I don't understand. I go to church every Sunday. By golly, that's not enough. That is not enough. It's not even remotely enough. We have to have God living inside of us. Literally, that means every morning I wake up and I'm like, okay, God, this is your day. What would you have for me? And God says, let me lead you. Let me lead you through this day. Things are going to come. Let me lead you in this day. That is what we need in our life. We need to fully recognize we have God living in us and say, okay, God, you're leading, I'm following. And then we need to follow. We have an active, present, powerful Lord who wants to be in intimately involved in our lives. And that's who led Jesus into the wilderness. The next thing we see is that Jesus is fasting. That's why he's hungry, right? He's fasting. He's denying himself of food. It seems like such a weird thing. And I, and I know that. It seems like a really weird thing to us unless you've, unless you've done it, right? And not just fasting. If you've dieted, you start to understand this fasting concept, right? Because what's happening here is Jesus is denying himself of something physical. He's denying himself that what's inevitably going to happen is, is we're going to get to this scripture that says, and he was hungry. Well, no, duh. Because when you haven't eaten, your body starts to involuntarily make these noises. It starts to involuntarily tell you, my goodness, I'm hungry. I need some food. Now, I, it is what it is, and I'm so sorry if you fall into this category, but I'm going to say most of us cannot call our diet one that is eating to survive. We couldn't call our diet fuel for the body. I can't. I can't. Jen, literally, not even knowing this, she made like 17 dozen cookies yesterday, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, Right? Because I know that I don't need them, but there's something in me that wants them. And once I want them, then I get it in my mind. And then I'm like, well, it's just one, right? Right? Like I'm just walking by and I'm going to grab one. It's just one. But there's something about when we tell ourselves, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this thing that my body is physically craving. What it does when we go against it, it starts to build this fortitude. It starts to build this endurance. It starts to build this recognition that I actually don't need what I thought I needed. And food is a really great way for us to learn and understand that. So what Jesus is doing is he's going 40 days without eating, and he is hungry. Don't, don't miss that. Don't be like, well, it's Jesus. He wasn't hungry. He was hungry. He was hungry. But he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny my body of this because, God, you are enough. You're enough and your way is enough, and your goodness is enough, and that's what I want to focus on. 
every massive movement that we see in the New Testament is initiated with fasting and prayer. Every one of them, fasting and prayer. It's denying ourselves so that we can be fully focused on God and say, God, you're leading, you lead. And I'm going to deny myself of this because then when temptation comes and temptation says, hey, Josh, you know you want this, I can say, no, I don't need that. I don't need that. I need God and he's promised me so much more. He is so much better. There's something about denying ourselves and waiting for the Lord. The third thing we see as Jesus heads into the wilderness is that he has been in the word of God. We don't we don't actually necessarily see that leading up to it, right? We do see that he goes to the temple as a boy and he has a conversation there and they're like, oh my goodness, wow, look at how profoundly knowledgeable he is. But we see that Jesus understands the word of God. He has been in it, he knows it, he has it committed, right? It's in his head. And even if it's like, did Jesus have all of scripture memorized? Maybe he had 30 years to give it a go. But we do know he had the ones memorized he needed for warfare. He was equipped and he was ready when he was attacked to respond. Luke 4, 3 to 8 says, The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. He was ready. He was ready, right? He was ready to respond when temptation comes. Any of you have those verses? Any of you have those verses that you're like, These are my verses. These are the ones that I cling to. So when temptation comes, right? And Jesus answered him, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. Verse five, and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He is tempted, and he points back to the word of God. He's tempted, and he points back to the word of God. Now notice, what this said to us, if we go back, it said, for 40 days, led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Jesus, I don't know why, I think it's because we get like the storybook mentality in our mind. Jesus didn't go and spend 40 days hungry. He didn't go and spend 40 days set apart, hungry, preparing himself because Satan was going to come and three times, right? Like what is that? uh, uh, Marley, right? Like Satan was going to come and like Marley three times in the middle of the night, he was going to give him these three things. No, 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 no. That's not what happened here, okay? He was there for 40 days being tempted and being tempted and being tempted and being tempted and being tempted. We get a glimpse of of three. We get to see how this period of time ended, but it says for 40 days he was being tempted. 40 days he was hungry. 40 days he was being tempted. This was war. This was an onslaught, and he had to be prepared for it, so he equipped himself in his life leading up to that with the word of God, and not just with these scriptures that he was like, okay, I'm ready to say this quip, but he was equipped because he understood the word of God. He understood the promises of God. Now, I want to pause here <clears throat> because of this, shift, this, this, this uh, scripture we just read, and, and, I, and I just want to point something out to you here. Satan, the way he's attacking Jesus, it says, you know, uh, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Basically, he's saying, you hungry? Why wait, right? And if you're hungry, I've got some food for you. And then he says, you know what? You look miserable. I can give you the world. I can give you power. I can give you authority. I can give you possessions. I can give you stuff. I can give you safety and security. And I can give you comfort. You will not want. And literally, there's suffering and there's security. And Satan's saying, you're suffering and I have security. We are talking about our suffering servant. We're talking about our Lord who came with the purpose of suffering for our sake. And the enemy's saying, I got security for you and comfort and pleasures abounding. Don't you want that? Do you know, I, I really, I firmly believe this, firmly believe it. We, we go to the missions conference every year, right? And I see missionaries just doing these incredible things. And I think, man, people are craving God and responding to him in all of these different parts of the world. 
missions in America, missions in the United States, it's tough. It's hard. Because people don't even know they're broken. People don't even know that they are in need. I know this sounds funny. Uh, yeah, I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to. We transitioned from a community an hour south of here before we came up here, right? It was like 11 years ago. Transitioned from that to come up here. That, that's been the hardest thing for me. The hardest thing for me is just that one hour. The demographics changed so much that so many people just don't even realize what they have. Or let me rephrase that. They don't realize what they don't have. They look at everything that they have and they say, but I'm good. And if I'm not, I can make it happen because I'm the one that's made it happen up to this point. I literally had somebody tell me my very first year, they said, you know why I don't believe in God? And I said, why? And they said, because if I believe in God, then I have to say everything that I did was him. And he didn't do that. I did. And Satan wants us to believe every second of that. He wants us to look at all of these new, awesome things and to say, I could have that. And man, wouldn't that make my life easy? And boy, if I had this, history tells us those things don't make our life easier. It just gives us more time to do more hard things, right? Not do more fun stuff. It just makes us be even more entrenched and enslaved in the things we're already slaves in. It's crazy. But Satan says, but you could have this and you could have power and you could have respect. And Jesus says, I came to suffer. I came to be a servant. Look at all the ways that you are tempted. I guarantee when you look at how you're tempted, you are tempted with pleasures and indulgence and just one more bite, one more cookie. Eventually that'll make me happy and eventually that'll be enough. And that's not the way. This is what Jesus says about Satan. He says, you are of your father, the devil, Satan, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is constantly lying to us and deceiving us and trying to pull our attention from God and directly to ourselves. He is a liar. You know, one of the greatest lies that we have in our culture today and understand, Satan is consistently lying to us. And if we start to catch on, he just changes his lie, right? So when I say, boy, there's lies today, they're going to change and they're going to shift, but they're always going to be lies. It, the greatest lie in our culture today is be you. Just be you. And as a Christian, that's kind of easy to, to, to bite into and believe because God created you, so you might as well be you, right? Because God created you. But the lie is be you. If you crave it, it's what you crave. Indulge. If you feel it, it's what you feel. Then go ahead. If you believe it, it must be true. Otherwise, why would you believe it? You're not a stupid person. Don't change. Be you and be the best you that you can be. Jesus says in Matthew 16, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him go against his desires and go against his passions and go against these things that he's trying to cling to and saying, I'm the most important and I need this and I want this and this will fulfill my life. And he says, let go of that and come after me because I'm God, because I'm good, because I have all that you actually need really need and not these things that you've lied to yourself in this present moment that you think you need right i'm what's clear beyond the fog last thing i want you to see here about jesus really it's about satan satan tempts jesus with the very words of god that's ridiculous satan tempts jesus with the words of god which causes us to often sit here and say well, that stinks. I'm in trouble. How could I possibly, how could I possibly be prepared to defend myself when the deceiver is using scripture against me? I don't even know that I know scripture well enough to stand up against it. How can I possibly be prepared. What's wild is, is we see temptations like adultery, lust, stealing, lying, murder. We see these temptations everywhere, and they're obvious. They're almost the easy ones to bite into, but when it comes to Christians, we say, ha those temptations, they can't have a hold on me. I recognize them. I see them coming. 
But when it starts to be scripture used against us, how do we know? How are we sure? Luke 4, 9 to 11, he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. He's like, scripture, and then scripture. Now I stop there, but if we continue, Jesus responds with scripture because he's God, because he's equipped with the Holy Spirit, because he knows the truth. But when we just get this, we stop and we say, man, our enemy attacks us, and he twists scripture for his own agenda. How do you stand against that? How do we stand firm? in a world where it is happening all the time, all the time, how do we stand firm in a world where our enemy is using the word of God against us? Honestly, that's where everything's been driving this morning. If there's anything with you that you leave today, it's the only thing I want you to leave with, okay? Here it is. Stop Googling stuff. Stop getting online and searching it. Stop going to Facebook and social media and whatever that is to look for your answers. Stop doing that. Stop thinking that, oh man, I, there's, this, there's this sermon coming up, the title of that, I'm going to find my answer there. Stop thinking that this is enough and your source of answers. Stop reading blogs that tell what Scripture really has to say especially about big, hot topics like same-sex relationships and gender, gender changes. Stop Googling, is fill-in-the-blank with your sin a sin? Because I promise you this, you will always find an answer that somebody uses Scripture to justify what you want to hear. I promise you that. It's crazy. It is crazy how twisted Scripture is out there. You are always going to find an answer where somebody can lie to you about Scripture and you are going to hear it and say, what, you know what, that sounds right, that makes sense. You are going to the wrong source. We're going through our um, uh, study uh, in there on Isaiah and uh, gosh, it was maybe a couple weeks ago, maybe it was three weeks ago, something like that. There was a couple weeks in a row, okay, sorry, side tangent, a couple weeks in a row where what happened is God's talking to the Israelites and what he's saying to them, he's saying, you dummies, what are you doing? You've got this army attacking you, and you're, you're going to Egypt for help? You're going to Egypt to ask them for horses and chariots? You're looking to Egypt to stand up and stand strong? What is wrong with you? I'm God. Egypt is nothing. Haven't I shown you that I can throw, overthrow Egypt in a second? Why are you relying on Egypt for war when I'm right here? I can't imagine how God feels when, we, when we, we Google what to do next with our life and we're looking for experts because people follow them or they believe they're experts or we put in a position that they never deserve to be in. And God's going, you fools. I'm right here. Why don't you turn to me? So, What do we do? What should we do? Let's go back. First thing we should do is we should say Jesus was empowered with the Holy Spirit. Every one of us should be on our knees saying, God, if you have not yet given me your spirit, please give me your spirit. I fully surrender to you and I want to follow you. Give me your spirit. And then we should be saying, God, lead me. Like literally, I'm awake, lead me. Tell me where to go. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to say. God, lead me today. Let me see your will in my life. And then God, guess what? I don't want to just see it. Help me to follow it. Because it's purposeless for us to see it and do nothing. God, I want you to lead me and then I want to follow your will. Stop looking for other people to tell you what God's will is. Go to God and say, God, what's your will for my life? Because I want to be all in and follow it. And here's the crazy thing. I promise you, I promise you, God wants you to follow his will and he wants you to know his will. He literally says, seek and you will find. Come ask and it will be given to you. He wants us 
not to be asking for food. He wants us to be asking for his will for our lives, and he wants to share it with us. That's why he's given us his spirit, so that he can make those things known to us, so he can be our guardian, he can be our guide, and he can lead us in this life. Do what Jesus did and start there and say, God, lead me through this. Let me know your will. I'm going to tell you, do what Jesus did and do a little bit of solitude. Jesus went 40 days to be alone when he was going for this battle. I want to be careful here, and I want to be clear here. I am not, I am not telling you to disconnect from the body of Christ. Scripture says everywhere we should not be doing that. Do not disconnect from the body of Christ. We are together because we make each other stronger. But what I am saying is, just like Jesus, temporarily we need to disconnect. That's where we shut down all of those other sources, all of those other voices, all of those other things that are distracting and calling and pleading into our lives so that we can just be alone with God, so we can just be in the presence of God. If you have a hard time hearing the voice of God, then shut everything else off. And you spend some intentional time alone and you make it perfectly clear to God, I'm yours and I'm all in. And the third thing is, saturate yourself in the Word of God. Live in it. Crave it. Read it daily. Read it continuously. Do I, do I believe that if you read the Bible every day continuously, you're just going to be this phenom expert in Scripture, and you're going to have cover to cover, everything memorized, everything figured out, and know every answer? No, I don't. Because the word of God is living and active and absolutely immense and incredible. I believe every time you go to it, if it's your first year, your 40th year, your 80th year, you are just going to be amazed and in awe and be changed as you are continuing to pour into scripture. But you saturate yourself in it so that when you're attacked, you have it to respond. But remember, that's not enough. I, I, often I see people that they saturate themselves with the word of God, but they're not concerned with the presence and the power of God and his spirit. It's all about knowledge and not about God leading, right? We have to have both, right? We have to have the word of God knowing that he is in us so that we can understand it and knowing that when we hear scripture that is a lie, we can discern it. I don't discern that scripture is a lie because I read God's word. I discern scripture is a lie because God allows me through his spirit to discern it and I'm able to be equipped as I continue to read it. This is an all-in kind of thing. And when we do that, you know what's going to happen? Because we see it, God says it all the time in Scripture, He's going to level mountains. He's going to level mountains. He's going to make His way known. He's going to shine light so that we could see where to go. He's going to make those things clear to us. This isn't telling us that we do those things, God's going to well, God's going to give us that safety and that security and those comforts. No, that's not what that's saying. What it's saying is, is God's going to make the way, the only way, the right way for our life known to us so that we could live the best life possible in his presence for his glory. Listen, there are hot topics right now of things that we can dig through and say, wow, look at these lies here. Our enemy is going to continue to change those lies because he has one agenda, and that is to pull us away from God. He attacks God by attacking us. That's his agenda. God wants to save as many as he can. Satan wants to make sure that as many people uh, that he can are not inside of God's salvation. These things are going to change. The attacks that come at us, the hot topics, the things that we go through. I mean, some of you that are, that are older than me, you're like, oh my goodness, uh, in, the, in the 70s, this is what it was. In the 80s, this is what it was. In the 90s, this is what it was, right? We are always going to have a deceiver, but we are always going to have the one same almighty, all-powerful God. We're always going to have the same solution to every single deception. We're going to have the same Lord in the face of every single temptation. That will never change. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, you are our defense and our fortification. God, you are our sword. You are our shield. God, the words that are used to describe you as our strong tower and our fortress, it's just, it, this imagery is all over, God. You are our light. You make our path straight. 
we are often lost and confused. We often are surrounded by the enemy. And God, when we are without you, we feel desperate and helpless. But God, when we're in your presence, we can be surrounded by the enemy and still feel like a victor because we know that you have victory. So God, that's my prayer. My prayer is that the people in this church recognize that you are absolutely enough. God, I pray that we recognize that you have to be the one that leads every step that we take, that you have to be the one that we turn to and that we rely on because it's foolish to rely on anything else. We have to recognize that your words are true and powerful and that we need you daily in our lives, God. And God, I pray that each one of us as we leave because it looks different for every one of us. God, that we can wrestle through in our lives and say, God, what are you calling me to deny myself of? What are you calling me? What are you calling us to give up so that we can see you and hear you and glorify you, God? God, we just love you so much. And we just pray in your son's name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
week I was uh, asking, praying for uh, a little something for this meditation, and I was reading Jeremiah, no, I was reading Isaiah, <coughs> and uh, the word redeemer was used in this sentence, it just kept popping into my brain the rest of the, the week, and so, so I looked it up, and I uh, couldn't find a dictionary in my house. So I had to go to Google, but <clears throat> and the definition read, to buy back, repurchase, to free from captivity by payment, a ransom, to release from blame or debt, to clear, to free from the consequences of sin, redeemed. The sentence in Isaiah 63, 9 reads, in his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. As we go into this time of communion, remembering our Redeemer, Jesus, and what he did for us, and the price he paid, that price cleared us. It ransomed us. It freed us from the consequences of sin. Jesus, my Redeemer. He lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving your son Jesus to redeem us lost sinners, to pay our debt, to clear us from blame, and claim us as yours. Amen.
Hello, my name is Todd Reffitt, and I am a missionary. Today I want to talk about something different. We have a, went from a sermon to talk about indulgence and food, and today I want to talk to you about leftovers. You heard me right, it's those wonderful extras that are tucked away in the back of the fridge, and you get a second crack at them, maybe for lunch at work, or just to throw out some options on a Sunday night, just to clean the fridge out, but there are those remnant, uh, remnants of that delicious meal that you had once worked very hard to produce. Now the question is, would you serve those leftovers as your first meal if you were having guests over that night? Would you serve them as your first meal if you were having your boss over for a meal? Would you serve him to Jesus if he was coming to your house? In Exodus 23, 19, it says, Bring the best of your first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. One word, not two. First fruits. Well, so then I said, well, what is this word, first fruits? It's a single word. I wanted to explore this word a bit more. So I went to three knowledgeable sources of information in my household. They're my children. First answer, they're pears. <laughs> Second answer, grapes? Note the question mark. Maybe fruits of the spirit? Also, question mark. And the last one, sometimes most insightful, definitely the funniest, red pears. You know, the ones that were on that tree in the garden. Clearly, I am not succeeding as a missionary in my own household, and we have some work left to do. They were very insightful, but not very helpful, so unfortunately, I did have to go to Google. <laughs> uh, apparently, first fruit is derived from a Hebrew word of bikor, which literally translated means the promise to come. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. That word, again, one word, first fruits. Different than a tithe, first fruits. According to uh, some research that I had found on the internet, uh, the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, it says when the Israelites first had emerged after wandering for 40 years in the desert, and they finally had arrived at the land flowing with milk and honey. They found trees of olives. They found orchards with grapes. They did find grains of barley and wheat. It was rich. They were excited. They used that ground, and they made it, and they planted their own crops in that very first year where it was their crops. They went out into those fields, and they designated the very first buds of the very first crops, and they tied a string potentially around them because those were God's. They brought those in with such exuberance and excitement because they had finally arrived at where they were promised to come, and these were the first fruits of those efforts, and they were giving them to God. And they were doing so with excitement and with joy. Not just for honoring what he had done, but for the promise yet to come. It's a cool word. So while I realize that not all of us are farmers and we may not be able to contextually realize what this word means, or we may not all be able to relate to tying a string around our first crops that come out of the ground. I know that sometimes our garden doesn't produce anything that is worthy of God. Um, it's not necessarily very pretty. But this year, my son was responsible for it, and it looked pretty good. But we can all relate to getting our first paycheck of the year. It's January. Maybe some of us can relate to getting a bonus from that great year that we had last year. So how will we show that we trust God and we are thankful for the faithfulness he's provided to bring us through that last year and that we are excited for the promise yet to come. So maybe it will be grapes or pears, red pears, or maybe it'll be something else. But I would urge us all to make our first fruits and not our leftovers. Let's pray for our offering. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for the faithfulness you provided us all of last year. And Lord, we look forward to the future that is yet to come. We are excited for the, the joy that you bring to our families, the love and the warmth that you surround us with, especially on cold days like today. 
Lord, I ask that you bless this offering and whatever it may be in it. Let them be our first fruits. Let us give them with joyful exuberance for the remembrance of the great faithfulness that you provided for us and the excitement of what is yet to come. Thank you, Lord, for all that you bless us with and continue to bless us with. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You are given six dice and a set of chopsticks. You have 60 seconds to try to stack them one on top of the other. Do you think you can complete this challenge? Find out if you have what it takes when you join us on January 20th from 3 to 5 p.m. for a family Minute to Win It event. Everyone will have the opportunity to play. Winners will earn raffle tickets for prize baskets. Don't forget to invite your friends and neighbors. We hope all Element Middle School and High School students can join us on Friday, January 26th as we head out to the Chicago Steels hockey game at the Fox Valley Arena in Geneva. Be sure to register for this exciting event. We are collecting winter coats, hats, gloves, and scarves for children in our local communities. Donations of gently used or new items can be placed in the container located in the lobby. Thank you for blessing others in this way. Do you long for peace in your finances? Join us for Financial Peace University and learn the steps you can take to achieve that peace. Class will meet every other Monday from 6 to 8 p.m. beginning January 29th. Sign up at financialpeace.fvcc.com. All men are invited to come enjoy good food and fellowship at our men's breakfast on Saturday, January 27th at 8.30 a.m. Bring a friend and come join us. RSVP to Daryl at mrifi2 at aol.com. Element, our middle school and high school student ministry, meets Wednesdays from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. We hope all Element students and their friends will join us for fellowship, worship, Bible teaching, and more. Awana, our preschool age three through fifth grade children's ministry meets Wednesdays from 6.15 to 8 p.m. All children are welcome. Encore Generation will meet on Saturday, February 3rd at noon. We will enjoy a potluck lunch followed by lots of fun playing chair volleyball. Please sign up at the Information Center and be sure to invite your friends. We're gonna do a slight extension to our announcements today because ain't nobody wants to race out to their cold car, right? Amen. Um, two things, two things I want to say because uh, one wasn't in there. Uh, next Sunday, next Sunday, uh, we have a guest speaker next Sunday. I will be here. Uh, our guest speaker is Russell Johnson. Um, he's a missionary in Africa. Um, actually, we're going to be able, when we do our ICOM at FBCC in uh, February, um, we're going to do a video call uh, with Russell Johnson at the beginning of it from Africa where he's at. Uh, but, uh, but you'll be hearing about this probably soon too. Uh, through Russell Johnson's ministry, uh, we are going to start uh, sponsoring a um, college student from Africa, in Africa. Um, we're going to sponsor them for four years as they get their degree in ministry uh, and are literally being sent uh, to a community uh, in Africa. And we'll be able to not only sponsor them during that time, uh, have a relationship with them, but continue to have a relationship with them afterwards. Uh, so that's part of why Russell's going to be here next week, um, and we're going to have an opportunity to uh, engage with him. So just want to let you guys know that. Don't miss that. The other thing is we've got our Minute to Win at Night coming out, uh, and I just want to make sure everybody understands what they're getting themselves into. This is for everybody. This is, although our children's ministry is the one putting it on, this is for, it's a whole family fun. So I need a volunteer. Thank you, Owen. Could you come up here really quick? Just, you, just, you volunteered so quick. It was amazing. Could you come up here? Owen's going to show us an example of one of these challenges, um, and he's, he's going to nail it. He's going to do so good at this. Um, so do you have any idea what you have to do? I'm guessing you do, but I could tell you. What you're going to do is you're going to have one minute. I know this is like an overwhelming amount of cups. We only needed three. So you're going to pull these. I'm going to make sure they're lined up. you got one minute to get all three of these cups to land into each other by pulling those, but you can't go until I tell you to start. Okay, you got it? Are you ready? Get set. Go. you got to be quicker than that, man. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go. Yeah. Oh, I pulled that way. Oh, 10 seconds. Hold on, Owen. Jen was overzealous. She ripped them for you. Uh, keep these, okay? These ones you'll hold on to. These ones you'll put in raffle baskets next week if you're here. 
which you'll be here now because you have five. Okay, so I know, I, I know, because I know how people are, that one of you is sitting here and watching this going, I could do that, um, and I know exactly who it is. Bill, could you come up here really quick? Because <laughs> I, I know Bill. I know Bill's sitting there, and Bill's going, Bill's going, I can do that. We did a minute to win it thing uh, downtown for the community for Elburn. Uh, Bill made sure that he could master every one of them. It was ridiculous. He kept practicing and practicing and practicing. And so Bill's just, Bill's a master at this. So nobody could do this like Bill. <laughs> I know. Do you want to get him right? Do you want to do four or five? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Golly, Bill. Do you realize it's going to take me like a long time to set this back up for you, so you better get it on your first go-through. All right, whoa, whoa, whoa. Marks, set, go. Oh, Bill! You have one job. You got to get it right this time. I'm running out of cups in my hand. Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's too much. We'll try four. We'll try, we'll try four. Look at my hands are shaking like crazy, and I'm not even doing it. Oh, pull it that way, pull it that way, pull it that way. Oh, I told you that way. It was leaning. What's your time? 29 seconds, Bill. You got this. <laughs> oh, and you're so much better than him. Well, I was looking. It was, it was off. Not that way, Bill. <laughs> you got the cups in your hand. We got 13 seconds. Can we stack it 13 seconds? Eight, seven, no pressure, six, oh, five. Oh! You know what, Bill? Don't tell anybody I'm going to give these to you anyway. Yeah, these ones you'll keep. These ones you'll put in raffle baskets. So seriously, seriously, join us next week. Be like Owen. Don't be like Bill. Um, but we have a bunch of raffle baskets that we'll have there, like, to put those in as you win. So all you, Brent. <laughs> All right, will you please stand for our closing song? I've got an old church fire singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. There's revival. And it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah. And it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you can lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got it all dirty. Sing 
singing in my soul Got a sweet salvation And it's beautiful I've got an ocean choir singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation And it's beautiful I've got a heart overflowing And I've been restored Yeah, nothing's gonna steal my joy Oh, man Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Hope you guys have a safe and warm drive home. Stay warm, all.